This is Theology 2, and this lecture is Humanity in Light of the Fall. Have you ever wondered what our world would be like if Adam and Eve had never sinned? Indeed, if none of us had ever sinned at all. It is almost impossible to imagine such a world. But let's take a few moments to look at the flip side of that what if question. How has sin affected us as humanity and how has sin affected our world? This is the question that we are going to try to find an answer to in today's lesson. The subject we are about to cover is astonishingly broad. I hope that by now, all of you are beginning to gain an appreciation for how much we cannot cover in a, any given class session. This is why self-study is so crucial in your own life as a believer. But having said that, we must still try to say some things about these matters as well as we can in the time that we in the time frame that we have. So here we go. Now, before we dive into this lesson, let me just make a quick comment that in this PowerPoint, um, many of the pictures of Adam and Eve portray them as. European or white Americans. And this is probably not very accurate at all. So just be aware of that. And I want to encourage you to see what lessons God would have us learn from this lesson as we go through this material. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is um, the base, our basic identity as humans. That is that we are sinners by nature. Ephesians 2, 1 and following says, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. We are by nature children of wrath. And in the NIV, it says that we are objects of wrath. That is, we are under God's judgment. So our basic identity is as sinners. And not only that, but we are sinners by nature. Now, we are sinners, but we are also sinners by choice. Um, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may recall the earlier video lecture where I um, went into detail about the different words that the Bible uses to describe sin in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And one of the, one of the basic key words is kata or hemartia, which carries this idea of falling short of the mark. And that's exactly what we see here in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This statement in Romans 3.23 constitutes a summary state conclusion to a long argument that go, runs throughout Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, that we are all Jew and Gentile, reached and unreached under God's wrath. Romans 5, 8, and 10 adds, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were God's enemies, 
we were reconciled. We could stack verse upon verse here, but that is largely unnecessary since there is little doubt that the whole problem of sin motivates God's solution for it in the person of Jesus Christ. Before we come to Christ, we are sinners, slaves to sin, who are incapable of rescuing ourselves. We are enemies of God under his divine wrath and condemnation. And this is by choice. Even though we are slave to sin, we still actively choose to sin. But before we get carried away with denigrating human beings because of sin, I want you to keep in mind Donald Blesch's warning that we should not forget the noble, good part of human nature. Genesis 1 and 2 tell the story of creation and declare that in the beginning, it was all very good. And this includes the creation of the first man and the first woman, because after God created man and woman, he said, he looked upon what he had created, and he said, it is very good. But it is obvious to us today that neither hum humanity nor the world is very good. From the local to the global scene, the world is filled with countless incidences of human cruelty, evil, corruption, and selfishness. And nature itself hurls harm and evil at humankind in the form of catastrophe, droughts, excessive heat and cold, and the like. So at this point, it is fair to ask, what in the world went wrong? How do we come to this low state before a holy God? The Bible explains the origins of these evils in Genesis chapter 3. Romans 5, 12 through 21 summarizes how all of humanity was affected. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18 describes the depths of sin. Romans 8, verses 18 through 22 states that even nature and creation itself suffers from the fall and looks toward redemption. These are some of the issues that we want to pick up on and look at a little more closely, although very superficially at this point. So let's talk about the natures and consequences of the fall. And we're right now we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 3. So the first question we need to ask is, why did God allow Adam and Eve to be tempted in the first place? This has been a troubling question and will continue to be a troubling question probably until the end of time. This is the heart of the problem of evil. Either we must conclude that God is all powerful, but not all good, or we must conclude that God is all good, but not all powerful. We cannot minimize the importance of this question for many people. How, we, how do we understand God in the light of the prospects of hell for the damned and the suffering and struggle and dominance of sin that we all experience in this life. If God knew that Adam and Eve would sin, then why did he create them? Why and why did God not stop them or prevent them 
from sinning in the first place. Was God powerless to stop it? And if he was not powerless to stop it, then what reasons could there be for God to permit Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve to sin against him? Luther's response was that it is futile to ask this question. God is the potter and we are the clay. We have no right to question God, nor will it do any good to question him. Now, this is true um, in light of Luther's tendency to denigrate human reason and to elevate God's sovereign power to the extent that he once was quoted as saying, if God told me to eat the dung off the street, I would not only do it, but I would know that it was good for me. Now, this is sounds like a very extreme statement that Martin Luther made. But before we are quick to snicker or turn away with incredulity, I want you to keep in mind that this is precisely the kind of faith that led Abraham to be willing to sacrifice Isaac. But for many, if not most people, this is not a satisfactory answer. However, in reality, we may not be able to give any other answer. Essentially, this is saying we do not know. God has not given us an answer. Yet, we, what we know of God leads us to believe that in the end, we will understand it to be good that God did permit Adam and Eve to sin against him. Now, a more common suggestion or a more common answer to this question is that God is interested only in moral behavior, which is freely given. Um, another way of saying that is that God wants us to freely choose to love him and to freely choose to obey him. Only this kind of moral behavior is worthy of one who has been made in the image of God. This is commonly accepted. This answer is commonly accepted because after all, God could have created a race of robots or a race of puppets, but why did he not do so. Yet we seem to have three choices. Either one, God decreed that sin would enter the world, or two, God foreknew what would happen, yet created the world and human anyway. Does this not make him somehow responsible for sin in the world? Or we have a third option. The proposed openness of God model, which limits God's knowledge to present knowledge and perhaps belief about the future based on present knowledge and limits God's sovereign or sovereignty. In other words, God is self limited, thereby allowing libertarian freedom, that is, genuine human freedom. The first option that God decreed that sin would enter the world makes God the author of evil. That is, it says that he is responsible for the presence of sin in the world. The second answer that God foreknew what would happen yet created anyway hold God directly responsible because he created human beings who brought evil into the world. 
The third option, best avoid the problem of attributing evil to God, but it runs the risk of diminishing God's knowledge and God's power. Whatever the case may be in the Genesis account, one thing is clear. Adam and Eve are responsible for the choice they made. God was not unfair or harsh or unkind in testing Adam and Eve. Calvin is probably right in seeing this as a testing of man willing obedience. God did not want man to fail, though God certainly could have prevented it. That is not the kind of relationship he wanted to have with humans. And he indeed made it easy to obey. Only one of the thousands of trees in the Garden of Eden was forbidden. And through the garden, Adam and Eve's needs were met. So God made it easy for them to obey him. We can draw an analogy from human parenting. Certainly, we can control the child, our child's behavior and provide all we can to enable our children to make the right choices towards God and in life. But a parent wants an adult relationship with their children at some point, and this is possible only if their children choose to do the right thing for themselves. At some point in their lives, the parent may allow a child the freedom to disobey and learn the consequences for themselves. It is their choice, not the parent's choice, even though the parent may have been able to prevent it. And so in, in, this is a helpful analogy to understand how God could have prevented sin in the Garden of Eden, but he chose not to. Why? Because he wanted to have a more adult relationship with humans. So let, now that we've addressed that question, Let's look at the question of the nature of temptation and sin in Genesis 3. One of the first things we have to note here is that temptation is satanic in origin. We're going to be looking at two things. We're going to look at the nature of Satan's temptation, and we're going to look at the nature of Adam and Eve's sin. So let's look at the nature of Satan's temptation. This is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 4 and 5. So Satan's Satan began by questioning God's word or God's instruction to Adam and Eve. He said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, this question could be taken in a couple of ways. One possible way is Satan was trying to question whether God really gave such a prohibition or not. Are you sure he said that? Or Satan could be asking the trying to get Adam and Eve to question God's character or goodness, sort of. Are you kidding? Did he, did God really say that? In either case, both truth and trust in God are at the issue. We have a questioning of God's truth and a hesitancy to trust what God says as both true and good for me and for others. <clears throat> 
And this actually, I want you to note that this actually corresponds to the gospel. Because the gospel is both knowing God's truth and trusting him in the light of that truth. So it's not enough just to know God's truth, but we also must respond to that truth by trusting that truth and trusting in God. Satan also questioned God's goodness, I mean, God's character, goodness and the reliability of God's character. He, he asked Eve, he, so he spoke to Eve and he said, you will not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. So this is, so we see that God, that Satan questioned God's character. Questioned whether God is really good or not. Now we see Eve's initial response. She said, she replied to Satan's question by saying, from the fruits of the trees of the garden, we may eat, but from the true fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Now, we see here that Eve affirms God's commandment, but she does several things that call some things into question right away. For example, she adds the phrase, may not touch it, which is not in God, in the command that God gave Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.16, because all God said was, you must not eat of it. And Eve said, you must not even touch it. She also leaped out the word freely from Genesis 2.16, and she reduces the emphatic nature of God's warning by eliminating surely from the phrase, you shall die. Because when God commanded them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God concluded that command by saying, if you do eat from it, you will surely die. In some ways, it already looks like Eve is taking the bait and is moving away from God's word. But the, but the final point of the narrative is that the real sin was in succumbing to Satan's next attack, as we shall now see. Let's look at the nature of Eve's sin. Genesis 3.6, I'm going to be, right now, I'm going to be comparing Genesis 3.6 and 1 John 2.16, okay? So Genesis 3.6 says, when the woman saw what, that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now, we can go through this step by step and compare it with 1 John 2.16. Because 1 John 2.16 talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. So in Genesis 3.6, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit was good, that corresponds to 1 John 2.16 word, the lust of the flesh. Then when it says that in Genesis 3.6 that Eve found the fruit pleasing to the eye, 
This corresponds to 1 John 2.16's statement about the lust of the eyes. And then when Genesis 3.6 speaks about how Eve saw that eating of this fruit was also desirable for gaining wisdom, we can compare that with 1 John 2.16 which speaks of the boastful pride of life. So here we see that the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, which corresponds to the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was pleasing to the eye, which corresponds to the lust of the eyes. And she also saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom, which corresponds to the boastful pride of life. And so, because of all of these wrong desires, Eve finally took some fruit and ate it. The final act of disobedience was the culmination of an inward process. Thus, sin is clearly, first of all, an inner act. For this reason, Salvation cannot be a matter of external behavior only, nor can it hope to affect change without inner transformation. So this is the nature of Eve's sin. Now let's look at the nature of Eve's act, which is um, her because her disobedience stemmed from her personal desires. Many have characterized the essence of sin as being self-centered as opposed to being God-centered. But other dimensions also seem to be involved. The first is doubting God's intention, purpose, or will that somehow there is something more desirable to have, which God is withholding from us. Thus, sin also reflects unbelief, not merely action or self-pursuit, because we refuse to believe that God's command is good. It seems that an implicit lack of trust, not knowledge, because their knowledge was sufficient, um, is involved here. It is a lack of belief and trust in what is known. Undoubtedly, God did not explain why they could not eat of the tree and why he had put it there. But they had plenty of evidence of God's goodness. Satan successfully planted the seed of doubt, and Eve let it germinate. We typically look to this event as the origin of sin. Perhaps there is another important aspect of this for our daily lives, that this provides a paradigm for sin. As believers, we are in the position of Adam and Eve more than unbelievers are. Thus, it is because we, we have already tasted of God's goodness, and we are already fully aware of God's teachings. Thus, it is important to know how Satan works and that we need to know God and grow in our experience of God so that temptation are not allowed to germinate and lead to the fruit of death. And we find this truth in James 1.15. So you can um, look at James 1.15 and see how, that, how it relates to all of this. Now, let's look at the nature of Satan's ongoing activity.
Satan's ongoing activity is characterized by lying and deception. Satan does this by first uh, encouraging us to question the truth of God's word. Did God really say that? Satan also lies and deceives us by trying to get us to question the goodness of God's character. And God lies and deceives us by trying to get us to question the reliability of God's character, not just the goodness of his character, but the reliability of his character. Um, and so we're, when we are talking about the reliability of God's character, we're talking about the question, can God be trusted? So he tried to get us to doubt the trustworthiness of God's character. Satan's primary tactic is lying and deception. He is a deceiver. He is a schemer. He is a liar. In fact, Jesus once said that Satan is, was a liar from the beginning and that his native language is lying. This is how he operates. One important observation from this passage is that Satan was powerless to make Adam and Eve sin. This may be a surprising statement, but it's true. Satan was powerless to make Adam and Eve sin. Instead, Adam and Eve chose to sin, and they chose to give in to Satan's lies and to give in to Satan's temptations. Therefore, Satan's activity is both cognitive and emotional in nature. Certainly, the same is the case for Christ, the Christian. He, Satan cannot make us sin. He will tempt, attack, and seek to otherwise influence. But Satan does not have the ability to make us sin. Now, Many Christians live in fear of Satan. Job makes it clear that even though Satan may have considerable powers, Satan can only do what God permits. Certainly, Ephesians 6.11 exhorts us to take Satan seriously because he seeks to devour. But scripturally, we can see that there are only two ways for Satan to devour the Christian. One is to get the Christian to get into his cage, or two, for God to decide to let Satan out for his, of his cage for his own reasons, in which case the Christian, Christian can still be victorious as Job was. And the point I'm trying to make here is that we need to teach our people not to be so afraid of Satan and evil spirits. We need to teach them to know their identity in Christ. Ephesians 5 says that we are children of light, and darkness can only prevail when we allow Satan to extinguish that light. So this is important for us to remember. Let's look at the immediate consequences of the fall. This is traced out in Genesis chapter three, verses seven through 13. The first immediate consequence we need to look at is shame. Adam and Eve felt embarrassment and a guilty conscience after they sinned, because they knew immediately that something had gone wrong. And the way they knew this was that they realized they were naked. Because earlier in the Genesis account, we read that 
Adam and Eve were naked and they had no shame in their nakedness. But now they were naked, they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed of their nakedness. This narrative portrays the shame associated with nakedness. And they, in, in this instance, they felt their guilt. Thus, they immediately became guilty and aware that they had done wrong. Their new awareness brought a novel knowledge of good and evil all right, but it was quickly obvious that Satan had led them astray as to the desirability of this knowledge. He had given them a half truth. And Satan, this is what Satan often does. He often gives us lies, but his lies are mixed in with just enough truth to make them believable. It is interesting to note that Adam and Eve's first awareness of themselves was not a sense of being godlike, but one of being ashamed. Even today, humanity's greatest shame and humiliation is nakedness. And here's the implication. Many psychologists and sociologists have maintained that shame is a conditioned response to cultural taboos. Genesis, on the other hand, portrays guilt and shame as an inbuilt human response to moral evil. Romans 2 talks of human conscience and an innate knowledge of good and evil. The inability to perceive these or to feel guilt or shame is the result of a seared conscience or a hardened heart, and it is not liberation from cultural conditioning. Another immediate consequence of the fall was an unhealthy fear of God. When Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden after they had sinned, what did they do? They hid. The knowledge of evil, the guilt that comes from disobedience, causes fear of God. Shame is part of their hiding, but also fear, particularly fear that God would see their nakedness. Was this shame? Was this guilt? God did not change, but their relationship to him certainly did. They went from having an intimate and confident fellowship with God to being afraid of him. We don't know what they fear. Was it the shame of failing God? fear of punishment or the consequences of sin? Or was it something else? But here's the thing. It probably doesn't matter which specific fear they felt. What matters is that the, their relationship with God was changed. Another immediate consequence of the fall was blame shifting and self-justification. This is the blame game. Adam blamed Eve for his sin. And if you read carefully, you will see that God also subtly, subtly blamed God. This is very subtle but he does seem to blame God because he's saying, this woman you put here, this woman you gave to me, she caused me to sin. So God is, so Adam is saying, it wasn't my fault. 
It was Eve's fault. And by the way, who put Eve here? That's what Adam was saying. Eve, in turn, blamed the serpent. The serpent made me do it. And today, people would say, the devil made me do it. Still, what do we see? God blamed them individually. It remains the human tendency to put the blame somewhere and not accept responsibility for our sin. And we see this all the time. In fact, you have probably been guilty of this. I have certainly been guilty of this at times. We all want to try to shift the blame and say, it's not my fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It remains the human tendency to put the blame elsewhere and not accept the responsibility for our own sin. So these are some of the immediate consequences of the fall. Now, let's look at some of the long-term consequences of the fall. And the first, the first long-term consequence I want us to look at is judgment upon Satan. And um, in Genesis chapter three, chapter three, verses 14 and 15, God pronounced the curse on the serpent. But the question here is, who is being cursed here? Is, it, is Satan the one being cursed here? Is the serpent the one being cursed here? Or are both of them being cursed here? If it's the serpent that's being cursed, why is the serpent being cursed? Stigger's view is that the pronouncement of judgment is primarily upon Satan and not upon the serpent. The judgment may have been depicted in terms relevant to a snake because that snake was the vehicle that Satan took in tempting Eve. If so, God's judgment on the serpent may well be a symbolic reminder of his judgment upon Satan. The phrase, cursed are you from among, or possibly above, or more than, all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat all the days of your life. This is the curse that God pronounced on the serpent. Now, it would be a change in the way of the snake, but not necessarily so. Stigger sees it as a continuation of the snake's humble state. To bite or lick the dust is an idiom that means to suffer defeat or to be humiliated, because snakes don't literally eat the dust, but they do live in the ground, and so they do live in the dust. So that's the first long-term consequence of the fall, judgment upon Satan. A second long-term, now, now we come to the first proclamation of the gospel, and this is found in Genesis 3.15. And we can compare this with, with Romans 16, 20. Now, this first proclamation of the gospel is also debated with regard to its meaning. Some, because in Genesis 3, 15, God says to the snake that he will put enmity or hostility between the snake and between the seed of Adam and Eve. So some have taken seed collectively to refer to one, hostility between Satan and host, Satan's host and humanity, 
That is, Satan thought he'd win their allegiance, but he would not, and there would be antagonism between them. Or two, that there would be hostility between people who would align themselves with Satan and those who would align themselves against Satan, perhaps implying the church. Okay, so we have this question, who does the seed refer to? Clearly, this judgment is that Satan's coup attempt would not succeed. He would not win the day, and in the end, he would suffer a crushing defeat. So this was the first proclamation of the gospel. Another, a second long-term consequence of the fall is pain in childbirth. So we see this, we see judgment upon the woman. The woman, God said that the woman would experience pain in childbirth. Now, you can compare this with 1 Timothy 3.15, which says that the woman will be saved through childbearing. Now, the function of motherhood, which was given to the woman, was a good gift from God. But after the fall, God said that childbearing would be filled with difficulty and pain. Sin brought a weakening of the body. And this is one of the places where the effects of that weakening of the body are felt. Perhaps a fitting reminder, perhaps this is a fitting reminder that as God brought Adam and Eve into the world and was pained at, that re, at the result, so the woman and men would be reminded of this fact with the pain of childbirth. Another long-term consequence of the fall is that the woman would have yearning for her husband. Now, there is another question here. Is this, is this yearning that the woman would have for her husband a punishment or is it a consequence of the fall? If it is punishment, then God allowed this for discipline. If it is a, simply a consequence of the fall, then this is for the benefit of all. That is, and God placed, and what we also see is that God places respons the responsibility on the man in the marriage relationship. The language seen here seems to suggest a deep desire, a dependence upon the man emotionally, physically, etc. In, in its extreme forms, perhaps these words signifies complete subservience. Now, some have suggested that this con this yearning is actually a desire for women to dominate rather than be submissive, as it is in Genesis 4, 6. And so it, it's saying that because of this desire of women to dominate their husbands or to dominate men, that the man will rule over the woman. Now, this is very controversial stuff especially in our day and age when there is so much conflict between men and women, when there is this idea that women should not be subservient to men. So 
we will take time to unpack this and talk about more about this during our class session. Another, now we come to God's judgment upon the man. And this is found, these judgments are found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. So one of the long-term consequences of the fall that God pronounced upon man is that Adam would now have to work the ground under a curse. The earth will provide for humanity's need, but only through difficulty and work, which is a sharp contrast from what was the case in the garden. In other words, work is, is now often filled with difficulty and even pain and um, many other problems. Another long-term consequence of the fall is eventual physical death. And I say eventual because if you'll, if you'll recall, when Adam and Eve sinned, they did not physically die immediately. Yet, eventually they did die because Adam died some 900 years or so later. So now physical death was not part of God's original plan for humans, but because of sin, we now have physical death in the world and all of us will face physical death unless Jesus comes back before that happens. Another long-term consequence of the fall was being banished from the garden. God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden, and he set an angel at the entrance to the garden with a flaming sword to prevent them from returning to the garden of Eden. So we see here that humankind is cut off from its original state and from direct relationship and fellowship with God. This is symbolized by being cut off from the tree and the garden because Adam and Eve could no longer eat from the tree of life. Now, the good news is that the tree of life shows up again in Revelation 22 verses two and 19 and the tree of life is reserved for those whose names are written in the book of life. So we will see, we, we have this promise that we will see the tree of life again someday. We also have the first act of divine redemption in here, in this account. And this is found in Genesis 3.21. God fashioned for them garments made from animal skin and not plant material as Adam and Eve had attempted to do. Thus, animal sacrifice is instituted by God as a covering for sin. So we see that sin affected not only Adam and Eve, but it also began to affect the rest of creation. So what we see here in this lesson is, and in this account, is we see sin and the consequences of the fall. And these consequences can be summed up by the words death and separation. There is separation from God, which is spiritual death. There is separation from self, 
which is psychological death. There is separation from other, which is sociological death. There is separation from nature, which is ecological death. And there is separation from life, which is physical death. And so all of these separations and all of these forms of death are consequences of sin and the fall. So, the, so this helps, all of this helps us to understand humanity in the light of the fall. And so in class, we will discuss this some more. So please continue to keep thinking about this and come to class ready to talk about what we've covered in this video lecture.